You know what I mean, shit, a black man with no insurance, shit. I can't pay him. When's your first time you smoked some weed? When I was eight years old. When you was eight years old? Yeah. Get okay. rich, die trying, fuck. Reasons I went back to prison, fuck. Carrying those guns again and trying to get the same people that killed him. Y'all shot down with two pistols, you know what I'm saying? 17 shots in his body trying to run home. Slim, we tough, we not scared of each other. That's the only way you put the Vitale called Flint, Michigan, the basketball capital of the world. My ability is definitely in the category. That's a strong statement. Well, you got a bunch of hungry motherfucking wild dogs, man. They gonna eventually start turning and biting each other, man. I mean, that's the biggest thing around here, basketball. Football, baseball was good, cool, but basketball was it. <laughs> this guy only do one thing. He's coming to rob you, kill you. Everybody want to represent Flintstone name now. Flint basketball, because it's a tradition. It go way back to well before Glenn Rice. It's, it's been a tra tradition for ages here in Flint. Over the years, it just kept his reputation. He studied developing good ball players. So, high school basketball stage strong, year after year. Based on the population of Flint, Michigan, and then you take the talent pool that comes out of it, there can't be a richer city of talent basketball wise in the country. For some reason it's like in the city of Flint, nobody wants to lose. When you're on the court, you, you're going all out. I put my money on me first of all because I know no matter what five I come with, we finna come to play anyway, you know what I'm saying? Egos. Egos, you can get anybody off any corner. The, the horriblest guy in Flint think he's better than any pro on TV right now or any college player. It's ego. That's the only way you can be out here. Ain't nobody gonna hand you nothing. Everybody think they the shit here. Everybody had an attitude that they're a superstar here. That's all it really is to do. I mean, you go to school, you play basketball, you wake up and you do it again. But we gotta have a time out. We gotta talk to them about the streets. Growing up in Flint, man, you gotta watch your back too, you know what I'm saying? I can see from here to the street on my little TV right here. Even though I'm in the hood, you know, I got to keep this with me too. You know, I feel like I say I feel safe in my own hood, but just in case the cat might want to take the little bit that I got. I'm talking about this sitting on my table is a hundred thousand. We felt the opportunity to take it, so we took. It. Right, motherfuckers dying up here every day, left and right. Here we go, man. Only thing boys got to do look forward here is getting fucked up every day. I'll use my money to buy crack. I use other people's money to buy crack. Cause we fucked it all up. Messing with that doggone crack cocaine, y'all call. Now you think about per capita, the number of players are produced. Not many are gonna produce more than they've done up in Flint, Michigan. Everybody wanna represent Flintstone name now and Flint basketball, because it's a tradition. It go way back to well before Trent Tucker and 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 Justice Thigpen and Jeff Grayer and Glenn Rice. It's it's been a tra tradition for ages here in Flint. The foundation of Flint basketball started in our generation with the Glenn Rice's, the Jeff Greer, the Andre Rise, and those were the pros that we looked up to. They were the most successful. And then came the Montine Cleves of the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Morris Peterson of the Toronto Raptors, the Eddie Robinsons of the Chicago Bulls, and the next generation, which was Desmond Farmer, which was just selected by Utah Jazz, and Kevin Tolka, who's going to make a major impact in the NBA one day. I guess it, it's in the water in Flint, man. Everybody grow up from 10 and under, 8 and under, 9 and under, whatever you play, Canusa. Everyone just grow up, uh, cause if any, anybody got a big name of playing, 
you want to play up against them and you want to beat them out and you're going to know about them and you want to test your game and your skills against that person and that's all I, I ever wanted to do is be the best person to ever come out of Flint, Michigan playing basketball. At an early age, basketball is big and important in the city of Flint. From the age of two years old and on, parents are giving kids basketballs to play with. Everyone has a basketball hoop on their corners. These kids in Flint feel like, I mean, they're so confident, so cocky. It's hard to, whether they're the best or not, they think they're the best. And to them, that's all that matters. I might know. I think I'm the best thing in Michigan right now. <laughs> Egos. You can get anybody off any corner. The, the horriblest guy in Flint think he's better than any pro on TV right now or any college player. It's ego. The team is the guy, in my opinion. When you talk about Flint basketball, you start on the team with me because he's the guy. He's the face. You know, if you could take a face and, and say, you know, who represents all of us collectively, all of us basketball players. You may have cats hating on each other, whatever. But if you say a guy that can represent, my team can represent the face of Flint basketball experience. Yo, my team came from Gray Street. I mean, anybody that know Flint know where Gray Street is. You know, his family was, you know, wasn't in the best situation. So you can you can see all that in the way he played and his aggressiveness towards his opponents and other. He works hard. He pushes anybody. Uh, he's a workhorse. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what he does. For him to even get to the pro level, pro am when we play, I mean, we go at it like we enemies. I go at him harder probably than anybody else I go at. My team Cleve, true leader, just a dog on the floor. I mean, his will to win, his drive, is something that I have never seen totally come out of flame, period. When he got to Northern, he was just, there was a man among boys, he filled out. As I said, ninth grade, he probably came in at probably six foot. I don't know what his weight was, but he had to be close to 180, 190 strong. Strong. My team is a real strong dude. So, I mean, he just got to the high school level, man, with him, Antonio Smith, which is 6'8", probably 250 in high school. You Robert Smith, which defensive lineman for the Tennessee Titans. Should I, I mean, should I have to speak on his size? Um, Deontay Harvey, which is an athlete, can just jump and shoot and shoot the lights off the ball. They came in with a phenomenal team. I mean, you knew that was a state championship once they all got together. But team was, he was phenomenal, a uh, high school player. My team and went to the Nike camp and gave Mike Bibby like 45. That's Mike Bibby, you know, and, and, and that's what we're really skyrocketed his high school career. Dude was just like amazing, man. People didn't understand how good this dude was at an early age, and people still don't understand, but they will eventually. Once he get that proper opportunity in the NBA to showcase his skill and his leadership, it's gonna be a big thing. You know, Morris is a success story. I mean, he's a blue collar kid, you know what I mean? He wasn't the herald guy coming out of high school. Uh, even his first couple of years, he wasn't the guy, but at the end of the day, it's kind of surpassing all of them. Mo Pete was a good high school player, but he was better <laughs> when he got to college, you know, and he realized, like, hey, you know, I gotta do what I gotta do. Was this was gonna set me down, you know. He was tough on it, but he made him a better player. He was better in college and in the pros than he was in high school. I think Morris Peterson that time, I think uh, Mateen Cleaves is a lot tougher than Morris Peterson. Uh, I think Morris, his identity wasn't there yet. He didn't have his identity yet. Morris Peterson, he always had the knock of wasn't a great high school player, was soft, those type of things. Now, my take on it is that you look at the average Flint player, they're grinders, they're real physical, and they're strong. Some with a lot of skill, some with not a lot of skill. Now, when you get to Morris Peterson, you're talking about someone with a lot of skill that doesn't have to do all the pushing and shoving and talking and scraping, doesn't have to make all the face expressions and talk a lot. It's real quiet. And, um, 
you know, Morris Peterson was one of the few to come from, you know, a mother, a father. My father's a principal, a school teacher. Um, so he was brought up right now. Not, not saying that he's not urban, he's not from the hood, which he is. He's come from end up. But he had a better foundation than a lot of the kids. So he saw life a little different. But when he got on that court, <laughs> come on, man. Dude was for real. People used to get on him, you don't do this, you don't do that. Dude can step past half court and let it go. Whack. You know what I mean? There wasn't a lot of people that could do that. The last person that was shooting, like Morris Peterson, in high school was, I say, Glenn Rice and maybe Trent Tucker. He's a phenomenal shooter. And for him to go through all the riffraff pushing a whole bunch of, he made the game real simple. Mo Peek gonna lead the game with 35. 23, 40, he may lose. He didn't have a supporting cast like my team Cleese did. He was the only gun. You know, he had Lamont Green, which is a, a phenomenal player, but far as strong five, he never had through his high school career. I don't think my Morris Peterson ever beat my team you know, in high school, but not, that's not saying that he never lit Northern High School up either. <laughs> Yo, kid put up phenomenal numbers. He was an unbelievable shooter. His career surpassing them all as he's, you know, he's sticking in the NBA. He's, he's, he's performing quite well. I think at the end of Morris Peterson's career, he will accomplish more than any of the pros so far to come out of Flint. That's including Glenn Rice. That's just my opinion. The one thing you're going to get when you come to Flint is you're going to get kids that aren't scared to play. When you go on that national scene, you're playing against some of the best players, guys that they've read about, guys that they've looked read about in school sports or Slam or Sports Illustrated or seen on um, that show SSI or something like that. These are guys that they're going to have to face. So, one, I want guys that either, one, don't have access to read about them based on, you know, where they live, who, I ain't never heard of them, or two, guys that are dying to play against them. When you come to Flint, most of these guys either one ain't heard of them or can't wait to play against them. Everybody think they the shit here? Everybody had an attitude that they're a superstar here. That's why it's so competitive. Everybody thinks they the next Michael Jordan, Allen Iverson to come out of Flint. We step on the court, you know what I'm We feel we bigger and better than the, than the next man, regardless of what you got. Whatever you bring to the nigga. court, James, we bring you, it back. You, you know what I'm saying? James. Our work ethic exceeds the next man, you know what I'm saying? That's what makes us bigger and better, because we, the competition is strong. You know what I'm saying? Man, end up. Flint players have a little bit more flash and dance to their game, as opposed to a Detroit player is just kind of nuts and bolts. If Chris Webber scored a bucket or Jalen scored a bucket, he might not leave a hand up in the air and kind of tease you or nothing like that. Where you take similar player guys try to compare Desmond Farm to Jalen Rose, well, maybe similar talents, but totally different type of players. Desmond gonna shoot that same three that Jalen shot, and he run out, he talking to you, he yelling, talking, he in the stands, he getting, you know, it's 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 uh, he's involved with the crowd. We born with nothing, we have nothing. There's not a lot of money here, it's not a lot of opportunity, so basketball is all we have. So we ain't gonna let nobody take what we have away from us. We're hungry. My, one of my favorite gyms was Pearson gym. I mean, I, I mean, a guy got killed in there one morning, you know, arguing about a car. A guy came back in there and shot, shot him one morning. There, here, and that was one of our favorite gyms. Burston, uh, Field House, we didn't got ran out of there. Guys coming in there with guns, arguing about a car or money, whatever. I mean, it's uh, it's probably countless times since, you know, my younger years. A lot of drama, a lot of drama in those gyms. We still tend to go back. Just the love for the basketball, I mean. Just Flint, we tough, we not scared of each other. See, I postponed graduation to give y'all mental emancipation because you can make a living off a master's degree and still be living by the slave master's decree. You shook. Because ain't no such thing as halfway crooks. Always at open gym but never open books. See, I'm just a reflection of you. And at one time, I was protection for you. But now I point protection at you and show no affection towards you. Our ancestors once hung from the same tree. Now I might kill you because we don't come from the same street. Kids always want to pretend. You always want to pretend something. 
cops and robbers. When you're growing up, cops and robbers. You know, Indians and cowboys. Something. You always, kids always want to pretend something. What do they have here in Flint to pretend? Basketball. That's it. Or drug deal on the corner. Once you have a basketball in your hand, people stop. People sort of cater to your needs if you specifically if you skill, and uh, everything comes easy. So uh, once that's taken away from you, it's kind of hard. It's another world out there when everybody's not giving you yeses and okays and uh, basically laying out the red carpet for you. And then once it's taken away, it's like it's hard. You know, people not going to get up and go to work for 30 years and and be hurting and. and messing with workers comp like our parents do so you know it's only one thing to resort to is either music or the drug game the community is just flooded with drugs so a lot of people that they grow up in Flint when when you don't have something to do and we out there hanging in the streets man you know, even though a lot of us are athletes a lot of us you know smart intelligent we get caught up in the in the game you know drugs and wanting things you know shiny things the good things that you know everybody is entitled to but it's it's the way we go about getting it and by the drugs being in the community we see oh that's my fast way to get that shiny car get that jewelry or put money in my pockets so i can have everybody look at me and have the females and the women so drugs man definitely yo so why is it that majority of the people that don't make it in basketball end up on the street selling drugs? Because they already was poor in the first place. So when they don't make it, you know, they only can go for what they know. That's the streets, you know? Right, but then the other, other point is they already popular, so they get the sack. They ain't gonna have no problem grinding. Right. Keeping that same right. money. Right. You, you, you got that popularity and get that sack, you gonna sell whatever you sell. Then, you know, they got to they gotta provide for their mom. They might have a little sister, brother, or, or you know, older mother, father at home. And they got to still bring in the bread in some kind of way. I don't condone selling drugs, but, you know, that's just the, that's the American way right now. They say it's more to life than basketball. But all I see is the hood. They tell me not to look up to the dope man. Well, who else is it for me to look up to? Only people I see positive coming out the neighborhood is NBA players. So I understand. When this ball stop, I'll be back on the block. Or either dead or in jail. It's kind of rough, but we it's maintain it. Rough. We get ours. How you get your we do? Niggas yeah, right. get popped yeah. in the club. Yeah. It's, it's we guys. barbecue. We, out here we barbecue. We hustle up a little bit. You know, that's all. One day we'll get rich. Just getting by, basically. One day we'll get rich and own our own store or something. Get rich, me. die trying. Fuck it. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we got the good wings on there. You know. Uh -huh. It's rough, but shit, I it's, mean, it's, it's like motherfuckers dying up here every day, left and right. You know what I'm saying? It's all about living your life right and shit. What niggas doing to get out the hood? Shit, man. Right. Anything they can. Buying restaurants. Anything they can. Buying You know, we trying, we trying to make it. We trying to make it. Niggas be balling. Yeah. Do whatever to get out the hood. All rap, whatever. I mean, I'm in the music. Right now. Cross, you just told me you just got shot, man. How'd that go down? I mean, in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the club. Cat just opened fire. He hit four of us. Where you get shot at? Shoulder. Bullet in my back. Where you was at, Beaver? Yup. You know it. You know it. That's the day. How long you was hospitalized? Oh, I was on the, Just today. Just today? Oh, yeah. I was just only in there for a day. Couple hours, you know me, no insurance, they ain't give a fuck about me. Pass me up, send my ass home. <laughs> Pass me up, send my yeah. ass home. What you mean they don't give a fuck about you? I mean, shit, a black man with no insurance. 
I can't pay him. It's no jobs for us for us either to have yeah. insurance. So hey, I mean basically they they study cutting the jobs here. Shit. And they don't like the well, they don't like us because we out here doing this. <coughs> but hey, this the only way we can do oh, it. Oh, At least we know where our money going to. <laughs> very difficult for the children in Flint um, to look and say, hey, I can be and do anything. We learn by example. Uh, all behavior is learned. Therefore, if we're not seeing attorneys, if we're not seeing scientists, if we're not seeing educators, if we're not seeing uh, bankers, if we're not seeing managers, then there's not a whole lot of hope. But if a child sees uh, a drug dealer, if a child sees a murderer, if a child sees a gangbanger, then that's his hope. And that's what he identifies with. You get a youngster, 19 years old, riding around with a truck, he probably put $25,000, $30,000 off into the truck. Uh, probably got $20,000, $30,000 worth of jewelry on. And pull up in the store and pull four, five grand out of his pocket. Then nobody tell on you, you told on yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you you on TV. You know, look, hey, look at me. You know what I'm saying? I'm the dope man. The hope, uh, the despair is on their face. And when they're in the streets, I mean, that, that, that says it all right now. If they don't have nothing constructive to do. Uh, then energy, uh, which they have an abundance of, they're going to do something with it. It's hard for you to make your way up and do it on your own without a lot of guidance. And I think Flint is lacking that now. Good leaders to help children. Who are some of the people you look up to? Ferret. Ferret. Like Ferret. You look up to Ferret? Yep. Hey, yo. Um, little dude say you his role model. A role model. Hey, <laughs> got your ass all up guard, didn't I? Yeah, that was a that was an uppercut, but I didn't expect that. Oh, and I mean the hood is fine. He don't have no father at home. It's just his mother. He the oldest boy. So he don't have no man figure in his life. So only man figure in his life is the guys in the hood. You know? They the only ones who care about him when he ain't got no coat. Niggas in the hood and he up buy him a coat. You know what I'm saying? Cause he ain't got no coat. You know, he out here walking around with no jacket on in the wintertime. Cause he don't want to feel chatty cause the coat his mama can't afford. So he he walking around the whole winter with no jacket on. So all the fellas in the hood, they got a little pot together. Let's get the little nigga coat. They came up through what we call the crack era. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when I was coming up, you couldn't be a player and a hustler and a scholar at the same time. You know what I'm saying? You had to be one or the other. Uh, and basically, that's the way we was bred up. You was going to be one or the other. But the kids that we bred up, well, they were bred up players, hustlers, and scholars. So the older generation could have no conceitment of what the heck they was, you know what I'm saying? Because they'd be getting A's in school, and later on that evening, they might be doing a drive-by shoot. These youngsters in the street, they want to hear from somebody who has lived that life. See, because they don't respect people who haven't lived that life. Yeah, young parents. Young parents growing up ain't really raising their children how they really supposed to be. Still partying, <laughs> getting out there, getting high and everything else. Your mother know you smoke? No, not we, cigarettes. When was your first time you smoked some weed? When I was still eight years old. When you was eight years old? Yeah. We don't have a youth problem in this country. We have an adult problem. Let me explain something here. Uh, and I've used this example uh, maybe, um, I think I just used it um, a couple of weeks ago in the Black History Month. You never heard anybody say, let's save the um, oranges, or let's save the pears, or save the peaches. You know what they say? Let's say the trees. Big Brian, my father, the man who gave me the knowledge to hustle and survive in a city with a weak die. 
He was one of the biggest drug dealers that ever hit the streets of Flint. Even though I went to college and played basketball, I had the NBA dream like every other black kid in America. Hustling was in my blood. I tried to do the right thing, but the reality is there's no opportunity for a young black man in Flint. It's wrong for me to sell drugs, they say, but it's all right for me to starve and live poor. I watched my father make 15000 a week. He opened the door for me. It was funny because uh, one of my friends told me that finally one day he said, you know, you know, you're my boy, man. He said, I got to tell you, you know, you know, I was I was supplying your son when when y'all was over on Swans on uh, Fairhaven. And I looked at him. I said, uh, So what you saying, bro? I was slinging dope in my basement on Fairhaven, <laughs> you know? And uh, <laughs> it kind of, it kind of. I don't know. It was kind of intriguing in a sense because. I thought that my dad didn't know, which was crazy because, uh, I mean, I was blasting. And uh, here he is blasting in my basement, you know what I'm saying, next generation, and I didn't know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I guess that's a change, of, you know, that's the change. You know, uh, I think that I was a little better than my dad. And, uh, I think that my son's a little better than me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that's okay. I'm okay with that, you know. You probably say your parents did it because of your environment, you're around everything, you know what I'm saying? What you see, your people, your family, you know, everybody who you know, is involved. You know, you always got somebody in your family that's involved in something, you know. Of course, it was bred in it because his mama was, you know, she was a hustler. I was a hustler. You know the old the old brothers from back. You know it, it was it's pretty easy to just, just get the nature of the beast in you. You know but that doesn't mean you know that you have to be. You know you you have the nature of it in you, but that doesn't mean you have to use it. Growing up in Flint, man, you gotta watch your back too. You know what I'm saying? I can see from here to the street on my little TV right here. I got one in the back of my room too. You know somebody ever try to come in on you? Yeah, I done had somebody try to come in on me before. I handled it though. You handled it? Yeah. General Motors left the city in the worst condition. With a population of 100,000, we lost 60,000 jobs. Majority of our parents and family members dropped out of high school to work in General Motors. So, General Motors gave the citizens of Flint an opportunity not to exercise their minds. So now that General Motors moved to Mexico, you have 60,000 people in the city of Flint who never in their life had to depend on their minds to provide income. End result, poverty, murder, crackheads, worst place to live in America. And these are the footsteps that the kids follow. I think that um, when I was growing up, GM, it was the honeymoon period and GM, you know, we had two cars in the garage, I had uh, full dental health care, that sort of thing, and Flint was thriving. But uh, like a long-term marriage, GM left and found a mistress and did not compensate the first wife. And, and that's problematic, and I think that's what you see as a result in Flint, Michigan now. But I think that this is kind of happening across the world with globalization, and I think we've got a whole major corporations responsible 
uh, for the repercussions and what they're leaving behind. They can afford it and we've got to start making them make an investment. Just like if a husband leaves a wife after 25 years of stay-at-home mom, we have laws in place that say you have to compensate her for her investment. So I think we have to do the same thing with major corporations. The media, especially with um, rap music, have told the story of Compton, California for many years. So my kids always thought because their father is from Compton that Compton was a pretty tough city. And when they saw the city and the condition of the city of Flint, they realized that Compton is a pretty nice place to live in comparison to Flint. And that's a pretty sad commentary. And you become set to a custom of living. Flint ain't always been poor the way, you know, they got us laid down as the poor. You know, it was a spot that was booming with job people migrating here. So when you become set to a custom of living, that's all you know. So and then them jobs ain't here that you became accustomed to no more. So now the only jobs here for the people who need the jobs is selling dope to the people who got jobs. That's the only job it is for the youth around here. To sell drugs to the people who got jobs. Crack cocaine came out with us. See, we abused y'all. See what I'm saying? We abused y'all because we took all of the money, screwed it up. Where well, y'all couldn't wear nice clothes. Y'all couldn't get, some of y'all couldn't get to college. Some of y'all couldn't get nothing. Because we fucked it all up. Messing with that doggone crack cocaine, y'all call it. You can do it in a... Let's see. I'm on a personal site, man. this I'm cooking off all of the impurities see what I'm saying uh -huh. I'm cooking off all the impurities this suck is going from ready to not drop that little sh drop a little of that shield water on it pop that that yeah. cocaine is in the oil it comes in a, it starts out you know from that plant it starts out in the oil oh now you done brought it back to that oil oh see all the impurities is gone so now, she is, you, you know, you smoking raw dope. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hang, I ain't done this in so long. I quit doing this mess years ago after I realized what it was doing for my buddy. This is the one that put the pimp out of business. How I put the pimp out of business? Cause, you know how I put the pimp out of business? Cause a motherfucker, you know, see when I was coming up, hell, I was getting head in high school. Most brothers that didn't know what head was till they was, you know what I'm saying, damn near married. But when this here came out, and the girls got addicted to this, she had five dollars to get your damn head job. So you know them hoes that they had out there on the block, if they got a hold to it, she had, they didn't give a fuck about the pimp. They had to have it. They wanted this here. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So a brother couldn't pimp no more. Well, this was pimping them. This was pimping the girl right here. You know what I'm saying? It's done. Couple of seconds. Couple of seconds and she in kill form. Okay. This is her. That's her right there. That's the motherfucking rock. Crack rock. First thing y'all think when y'all see me is damn, you big as hell. How come you don't play no ball? Because when I was working on my, my jump shot, I got tired of hearing gunshots. And even though basketball can make the mansion's door unlock in the hood, a lot of kids are saying step pops to their real father. Now we just want to shine. Gangsta rap filled with foul lines telling blacks the only shots are on the block or the foul line. Causing us to run 
on the court or from one time. So take your pick, sports or street crime. So why not pack steel? Because according to Walt Disney, a lion will be king in Africa before a black man will. And when the NBA stops, so does our motivation. It's easy to put the blame on the kids. But let's take a deeper look. How you expect us to win in life when there's liquor stores in front of all our schools? Take a look at our gyms. They're spotless. It can hold up to at least a thousand people, or even more. They have new bleachers, new floors, and a security guard to make sure they're safe at all times. But on the flip side, our schools they have dirty bathrooms, filthy water fountains, not to even mention our classrooms and our literature books. Uh, compare our ninth grade children with the uh, sixth graders in our suburb areas of Grand Blanc, Flushing, there would be an accurate comparison. I would think our seniors would be um, in comparison to perhaps their eighth graders or ninth graders. Our city, our school is designed to produce basketball players. Who cares about the everyday kid? Beat your high school, you only have to have a 1.8 to play basketball. On the national scale, it's a 2.0. And by the way, Beecher Library has been closed the whole year. The library, to us, the library been closed because it mean I I ain't used the library since I've been in high school. I mean I never rent, I never got a book out of there. I never touched the computer there, and the only time I went there was driver training in the summertime. It just it's no it's not even a library in this year. I, I mean that's something. Hey, how was it like going to school in Beecher, sister? Um, it's rough. It's rough, really rough. It's uh. Kids, kids is really, really bad. Like bad language. No respect for teachers or elders. It's like bad. Man. It's like they're bad. They raised bad. Because the administration, they make an un. On, uh, they making disappointing, disappointing decisions to close our schools. They failing to help us succeed. They failing to buy us. They failing to buy us resources, math books, science books, laboratory stuff for our science department. They failing to do that. But they riding around they BMWs and Mercedes Benzes while we sit here in a poor community, a poor community, a school system that we help build. While they come outsiders come and tear it down. We got to suffer from what decisions that they make here. It's a lot of drugs in school. Yeah, in one class, um, one guy brought a, uh, some weed class, and uh, they were smoking it, and uh, they were shooting a flame around with uh, cologne and smoking the weed, and finally the teacher smelled it. Some kids got off, some didn't, so some really, really got in trouble. I, after that, I really didn't know what happened. And what grade was that? Seven. Seven. Yeah. Okay, when you look at other schools, especially in the state of California, all sports are equally important. Whereas in the city of Flint, there is a main emphasis put on basketball. Everyone is encouraged to play basketball from the age of two years old and on. Parents are giving kids basketballs to play with. Everyone has a basketball hoop on their corners. In other places, you don't see that. It's, it's more well-rounded, and kids are pretty much encouraged to try all things. Whereas in Flint, they're pretty much directed to play basketball. The gym, that's my classroom. And my responsibility is to teach them, just like an English or math or history teacher. When I, when I first saw a Flint high school basketball game, it was incredible. And I'm talking about just in a regular high school setting. I'm talking about with, with your 18 or 1500. I had never seen anything like it. But the best example I can give you is when you go to a city game, Flint Northern versus Flint Northwestern, Flint Central versus Flint Southwestern, nine times out of ten it's a sellout. You have R. Kelly, he'll come to our sports arena, he won't sell out, but let it be Central and Northern playing basketball, man that place got over 5,000 people man. Probably the only thing we got here. One of the biggest things we got here is high school basketball. I mean, there's nothing else really here. I mean, over the years, it just kept its reputation. 
study developing good ball players. So high school basketball stays strong just because we study producing year after year. He was the highest rated one ever to come out of Flint. He just dominated high school, man. It was no comparison. Got all the accolades, just Mr. Basketball, Mr. Basketball, National Player of the Year. I mean, I think what what top five best player in the nation. The highest rated one ever to come out of Flint. He was actually uh, uh, the National High School Player of the Year. Uh, different players in Flint had different strengths, strong strengths. Like Glenn was a great shooter. Mateen was a great floor leader. And, you know, Antonio was a great rebounder. And the things with Kelvin, he brings all that to the table. He's, he's like everybody game all in one. That's why when people ask the question about the NBA with Kelvin, it was no question. What else was there left for him to do? He dominated everything he ever, ever touched, basketball-wise. He was a professional out of high school, no question. A lot of people will say they heard Kelvin could have went pro in high school. I'm probably the one person that confirmed Kelvin Torber would have been a pro. He would have been drafted out of high school. I sat down, I'll be honest with you, I sat down with his brother, and we actually flew out to another city, and we met with some people. We met up with a few different scouts and, and some people that assured us um, that Kelvin would have been drafted in the first round. If, if you want to look at it physically, he was bigger than Kobe coming out of high school. Uh, if you want to look at it physically, he was more mature and closer to his manhood than Kevin Garnett was. I mean, if you look at LeBron James and you look at Kevin Tober, you couldn't guess their age by their man side. If they talk to you, you will say, oh, he's a young dude. But just looking at them in their physical appearance, you couldn't tell that they were that young. I never thought I'd be in this position. Ranked number fifth in the nation. Can be the first player from my city to go pro straight out of high school. Agents, they telling me to go pro. Family, they telling me to go to college. I'm only 17. It's a heavy decision. I have two choices. The NBA is guaranteeing me $3 million or college, guarantee me a free education, become a role model, what would you do? I chose Michigan State. A lot of people don't realize Kelvin was 17 at the time, so his brother felt like just emotionally and mentally, I don't think Kelvin is ready to sit on an NBA bench, play 82 games, and travel the country. It's teaching him how to be a stronger person, all the things that he's going through. Everything since he's been a child has been so easy for him. It's just been, you know, basketball, when he stepped out there, everybody praised. Everything has been easy. You know, like, if you don't take no lumps in the road, you're not going to get strong. That's what's going to make you stronger as a person and mentally and stuff. And I think all the things he's going to, going through and all the adversity and things is helping him in the long run be a stronger person as, as well as a basketball player. And I definitely respect Lamont Green's situation. I mean, his decision in, 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 in making him go to school because in all honesty, it's the right thing to do, you know. But um, I don't think I'm that righteous <laughs> where I will, um, because I mean, what the NBA can do for that kid's family and Lamont and his generation. Kelvin had an opportunity to take himself, to remove his family from that situation and put him in a, a better positive situation. Whether he would have made it or not, that's not the point. The point is, me and you, we all might work for 30, 40 years and might not ever make one, one million dollars. Kelvin had a chance to make that in one year. Jason, freak of nature, I mean, literally a freak of nature athlete. It's freak of nature. I've never seen anything like it, personally, up close. And uh, I remember going up to Jason, and he was talking about this. He was being interviewed about this, actually, about a month ago. 
And I remember going out there telling him, man, you let that freshman put it on you like that? That freshman was going away. Man, Coach, who you talking about, man? That, the one that we were struggling with was the big, strong boy, the guy. I said, he's a freshman, Jason. He ain't no senior. No, Jason, that boy in the ninth grade. Man, I got to see him for three more years? <laughs> I said, yeah. Oh, man. Seeing them, them two type of ball players out on the same floor was just amazing. The things they could do with the ball, the leaping ability they had, and when they went up against each other, it was just all competitive, all competitive nature out there, and they just just, just let it all hang out. Pretty much a dunk test. I mean, they both was athletic, could jump. It was a lot of excitement going on. It was <laughs> from from start to finish. I mean, it was something. You know, it was like it was like you were waiting for something to happen, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's boom, 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 it's happening. You know, Jason dunking. You know, told were doing it. I mean, they were taking off from the free throw line. <laughs> it was like, boy, I ain't seen that in high school. <laughs> Ever. He's one of the most emotional players that I've ever been around. I mean, this kid, from the time he walks out on the court to warm up, it's all about emotion to the time that, you know, the, the horn goes off and the game is over. The heart, his confidence is there. His confidence never adjusted. His confidence has always been on level 1 to 10 to 10. His confidence never dropped. I mean, he probably, you couldn't tell him he's not the best player playing basketball right now. And he still feels the same way. I think that took him a long way. A lot of people get confused by him, about his emotion. I think, um, I, I don't know if this was the reason. But last year, Desmond was the second leading scorer in the Pac-10. Didn't make all tournament. I mean, didn't make all pa all league, all conference. He didn't make all Pac-10. <clears throat> and, and part of that, I think, was because Desmond, he'll shoot a three in your face and then tell you about it. And tell the coach, you better get somebody out here to check me. I'm about to heat up, man. This guy can't check me. I'm about to, I'm about to drop 30 on him tonight, coach. So a lot of people, you know, mistake him as a bad kid. He has a tattoo, so they might think he kind of thuggish or whatever. But he's a great kid, sweet kid, one of the nicest kids I've ever been around. Plays with just so much emotion. You know, plays hard, hates to lose, and, 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 and will come at you. Dez's thing is, you know, he live and die with that three. Uh, he really does. He's strong going to the basket. But his biggest thing is, I mean, recently this year he drops 40 points on Arizona. And uh, I think he had about eight or nine threes. Dez lives with that three ball. That's his thing. I'm going to shoot the ball. I'm going to shoot him to my arm hurt. As, that, as we said, there's one thing about this. He ain't going to be shy about getting any shots up. He'll shoot it until literally his arm starts hurting. He going to shoot that three ball. That's Desmond Farmer. Des, you know what I'm saying? We came up as youngsters, and he had that determination when he was little. Despite all the animosity a lot of people in Flint had towards him, he took that and channeled it into, into a passion for the game instead of a passion for hatred. You know what I'm saying? He channeled that passion, and that's what got him to where he is today, sitting right down here now, waiting on his name to be called. You know what I'm saying? He waiting to be a millionaire. How many people can say that, that they was waiting to be a millionaire? You know what I'm saying? It ain't about rolling them dice. It ain't about playing them card tables. He's sitting there waiting to be a millionaire, cuz. He's sitting there. Atlanta Hall. Man, Atlanta took Roy Ivey. Uh, you don't want there. 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 We gonna hear his name called tonight, yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you that right now. So you, you that shit gonna I'm happen. Straight, I mean, my agent them already told me, you know what I'm saying? Don't be juiced about being 26. I already know that. When you walk in that motherfucking gym, walk in that gym dead fire. I'm walking that motherfucker, nobody else. Walking that motherfucker, the same Flint motherfucker you was at them workouts. I'm busting your ass. You ain't shit to me. You's a bitch. You got drafted me before me, but I'm finna let these motherfuckers know it was all some politic bullshit. You ain't shit. Give me two weeks and I'll be in your spot. I ain't tripping, man. I'm straight. I know that. Man, I just want to, you know, we don't get to have too many fucking, you know what I'm saying, heart to hearts. Yeah, so I just wanted to come out, man, 
and do I'm that. I'm cool though. I'm straight, man. Let me go. I'm, I'm yeah, chill. just go have a good time. Now we yeah. all on good time now. <laughs> you know he a little nervous right now. He a little nervous. He don't know where he going. T5 so, so love to everybody. For so free. you know what I'm saying. So shit. he going through a thing. I just wanted to talk to him. Make sure he's straight. Brother to brother. Love to love. Keeping it real. Do. Oh, Corey Hot Dogs game is, is exceptional. Flash, uh, wonderful off the dribble, uh, extremely great ball handler. Uh, he can pass, shoots the long ball extremely well. Skill-wise, I don't think it's the more skilled player to ever come out of Michigan. And that's saying a lot. Skilled player. Very skilled player. Uh, probably on pro level. With the McGrady's, Kobe, skill-wise. I mean, I just, off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone in this area, you know, that can handle the ball like Corey. You know, has, has shown that he can have a ball. He's phenomenal. Phenomenal specimen. I, I done seen him destroy pros left and right. You can't guard him. It's almost impossible to guard Corey Hightower. When he at his best, yeah, I put him against anybody. I had encounters with their coach down at Mount Zion. He'll tell you to your face. You know, he said it nationally that, yo, he have more skill. He's just as good, and if not better, than Tracy McGrady at that time. I'm not saying right now. <laughs> at that time. On the skill level, I think he's probably more, probably the most skilled play, player I ever coached, and that's including Tracy McGrady. I think he was probably better, but it was just that the money was behind Tracy McGrady at the time, and then Tracy McGrady was a senior, he was a junior, and um, you know, so he had to deal with that. But it's also that Flint mentality again. You know, who want to take second to a person that they think they and feel that they better than? In his eyes, you know, Montaigne Clay just won a national championship. Morris Peterson just won a national championship. And they in the NBA draft. So if they can do it, and I feel I'm just as good as them, why not me? So... You know, he took that route. You know, he didn't listen to a lot of people. Yeah. Which he was drafted um, by San Antonio. Was traded to the Lakers. Um, and 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 um, just didn't pan out. You know, a lot of people say his attitude. A lot of people say he just was in there. You know, they thought he was. You know, which that's just that Flint swagger. I think. You know, but I think it's still, you know, once you're on that level, you have to play by their rules, you know, and, you know, it's the doorway if you don't, and I think that's what happened, I mean, because, I mean, it couldn't have been skill-wise. I mean, he was young at the time, I mean, maybe 19, 20, and drafted by the Lakers, and maybe he was overwhelmed from that, and I think just the aspect of being a pro possibly could have been the best, people say. I, I probably would say being a pro is more than you know just you know his skill. I mean, he got professional skills. I mean, he's up there with the best of skill wise. But I mean the small things, eating right, getting up, running, working out every day. You know, for the trainer, lifting, just the small things, being a professional, things that they want to see on that level. I think that's the only thing that hurt him. Probably his attitude. I mean, he was young at the time and his attitude. It, basketball is not the issue with Corey Hightower. Oh no, no question. Basketball has never been the issue with Corey Hightower. It's been off the court with Corey Hightower. His basketball game is great. You know, it's, a lot of people say, you know, his um, NBA career is over, he should go overseas. But I honestly don't think so. I think if he humble himself right now and just really listen and understand how the game works, you got to learn how to be a professional outside of basketball or not just being able to play basketball but 
I mean, you look at Jordan, he didn't have to be humble for nobody, but he was. Because he understood what makes a superstar. You're not humble, man. You're not, you're not accepted by the people. You're not accepted by the fans. You're not accepted by the players. You're not accepted by the coach. I don't care how much talent you have. You're not accepted by those people. It just don't work. Jermaine Smith. Check your actors a lot. Uh, Jason Richardson. Mateen was, he was phenomenal. Michael Curry. Corey Hightower. That's Hightower setting. I mean, he, that pro-am is, is, he lives for that pro-am. I mean, I think, I look at him like, um, I mean, George Gervin in some ways, you know, when he gets in the air, the stuff, he, the moves he make, I mean, he, he is so exciting with the ball, I mean, I mean, he can handle the ball, he can shoot it, he can pass it. Um, I mean, he's a highlight reel. Like I say, this is Flint. When, when guys from Flint see different guys, especially pros, coming into the city of Flint, our home, trying to play ball, that's when our guys just take it up another notch. Take it, Jermaine. Every time, take it. Jermaine. Take it, Jermaine. Every time you get it, take it. Jermaine was really demolished a lot of the players that was, you know, in the city. A few pros that used to come in, as far as Eric Snow, um, just various pros to come in the city. But this was one pro, Chuck Yakin's been lighting people up throughout the program, and this was the first matchup that him and Jermaine had. So everybody was waiting on this. A lot of kids in the gym, a lot of drug dealers, all the thugs. It was crazy. It was a crazy environment. First play of the game, Jermaine come down, cross. I'm across, went to the bass and got a layup. Just something to loosen them up. But then Chuck Yakin's come back, pow, between the legs, layup. Everybody going wacko. It's going crazy. So. Chucky come down, three-pointer, bam! Jermaine come back down, three-pointer, bam! They really going at each other. Jermaine jump up in his face. I started it. I was just looking forward to the challenge. He run up on him, picking him up full court. Come down, Jermaine come down one play. Get ready, shoot. He smacked the ball out of his hand. Throw it back out of bounds. Jermaine catch it. Three-pointer fade, not a bounce. Two players in his face. Wow! And that's what started it. Jermaine jump up in his face. Flint Town, bitch! Just to let him know I'm out there. I'm going to be out there for the whole game. Just to let him know that. It was, it was a real crazy matchup. He a lot stronger than you thought. He could take the bumps. You could tell he played with pros. He could take the bumps. He could take the contact. That surprised me much because he looked wimpy, really, to me. I feel like I won the battle. Uh, I had more points than he did. But I had 30. I think he had maybe 24. I showed a lot of people with what I can do, and I can play out there with them guys. I always tell Jermaine this. Uh, I think him not playing high school, he threw away $15 million of the NBA's money. Um, I always tease him about it, but, you know, he know he's phenomenal what he do. The program is, is awesome. You know, I think it's, um, it's good for the city. I think it's good for the kids, especially the younger kids, because it gives them, especially in Flint, it gives them something uh, to, to want to emulate, something to strive, somebody to emulate, and something to strive, you know, for. Um, especially because the guys that play in it now, most of the older guys don't play in it. The pros, the older pros, don't play in it anymore. But the the new group of guys, the younger guys, you know, Mateen and Kelvin and uh, uh, Morris and. Charlie, those guys are good citizens. They're good people. And that's great because, you know, their character also shines when they're playing. Now they're tough and they go out and they may talk a little stuff, but when the game is over, they always spend 15, 20 minutes messing with the kids on the stand. Or if they come to the game and prior to their game playing, you know, you watch my team, kids just, whew, you know, he 
like a magnet. They just whoosh, they just want to be around them. They just want to sit with them. I think that's good for the city of Flint. I think if, if the Pro-Am went away, it would be, it'd be bad for the whole community. We too stubborn to talk our problems out like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington did in the great debate. And is it our fate to be a thug? And when was the last time you gave your boy a hug? Yeah, when? So you don't know because you're too busy hugging the block and hugging your revolver. And I bet you that hug question wouldn't it seem so gay if you were getting hugs from your father. Your man locked up right now, wishing he could be alone. He'd take a shower talking about he ain't trying to work no minimum wage job, man. So holler, but if hustling don't kill you by the time you get out of jail, you're going to wish you get that six fifty an hour. This street's hurt. I know cats who stay in the block for a week straight and every day wear a different rest in peace t-shirt. And can you explain your customer base and how it affects your um, clientele? Um, well, the customer base, we do a lot of, um, you know, family reunion. We cater to a lot of the schools and churches and different organizations and small businesses and stuff like that. That pretty much would make up maybe about 5 to 10 percent of, of our business. But between 90 and 95 percent pretty much come from the, the memorial shirts. And um, it, it's sad to say, but really, that, that's really where the majority of business really comes from, is, is, is from tragedy. As you can see, a lot of the t-shirts that are up here are memorial t-shirts. Even one here familiar with a familiar face. Uh, guy that I recently knew that was living here in Flint, well-known guy, uh, Jamar Lee, that was brutally and tragically killed here in the area that was basically just mangled, arm, legs, you know, just beaten to death and everything, just just massively left in the trunk, you know, at a, at a nightclub basically here in the Flint, Michigan area. I mean, it was a tragedy. I mean, real hard to take and just one of those things that's going on and, you know what I'm saying, all the, the young people here in Flint are almost getting adapted to the type of things that are going on in the city. It's here. There's a picture of my little cousin, what I call him, my brother. He was killed in 1999. So I put him on the hood of my car just to show everybody that I still love him and want to rep him every day. And this is one of the reasons I went back to prison for carrying those guns again and trying to get the same people that killed him. You know? Some more things I want to show you, man. As far as growing up in Flint, I got to take one of my homies' heads out of this shot. But these is the type of licks we done did. Came up on money. I'm talking about this sitting on my table is 100000 had my girlfriend crying in the living room wondering what we did. You know, it's, it's like that around here. We felt the opportunity to take it, so we took it. You know? um, and if you don't believe me, I wish you could be here to see it. Count the main one. Them is, them is hundreds and fifties up there. You know? Um, I got another picture of Jules and a picture of. Uh -oh. A picture of my uh, I can't I can't explore him like that, but another picture of us counting money on the table and things like that. But this is one thing I wanna show you that I don't wanna see no other kids in Flint have, man. And that's this basic information sheet from Michigan Michigan Department of Corrections, man. And this here reads for my second case, carrying concealed weapon. Now I got caught with two guns and a bulletproof vest on, a pocket. Pocket full of bullets. I ain't had no little guns. I was ready, man. You know what I'm saying? Then down here describing what I went to prison for. The first five and a half years, man, was Reeves. Murder in the second degree. And felony firearm during that time. This is something, man, that's... As I keep this paper, man, I'm going to show my kids when they get older. Just so they'll know what their daddy went through. And I don't ever want to see them holding up something like this, man.
Who want to work at 7-Eleven when you can roll 7-Eleven? I sit back and watch the news at 11 and I got the hood blues because young dudes is making the news at 11. I was watching the news yesterday and um, it was our local news actually and I just saw a kid shoot another kid. A 10 year old can get a gun, a 9 year old can get a gun. But on a cold December night, while armed in their self-proclaimed war zone, Anthony and his friends learned just how real playing with a gun can be. I asked him, give me the gun, so I could play on the camera with it again. And I started playing with it on the camera, and I caught that back, and I shot it. Hey, If you gonna change, how you expect our kids to change if we seeing images like that on a consistent basis? That's all we seeing. So, it's not kind of we get immune to it. Oh, no, I am. For some reason, um, the media has exposed uh, their weakness or sought off to destroy their image. How's it going? My name's Eric Thomas. I represent Miscellaneous Records Incorporated. Well, now I do. Before, I was just an artist, trying to make it like anybody else, out here in Flint, which is a hard thing to do. And uh, basically, you know how Flint is, get to the clubs, get hanging around with a bunch of different people. Maybe not end up going to school, skipping. Let's see here, September 19th was um, the last time that I performed. I hold the microphone. In fact, it was at my house, and uh, we had our promotional party that night. We were going to get signed a, a nice little record deal with this new company, and we negotiated that earlier that day. And uh, later on that night, we had the promo party. We had it at our house, which was unprofessional, because people come, they don't even know. Uh, about a uh, quarter to two in the morning, I went outside to check the parking lot, you know, see everything was straight. Made sure people that were at my house were acting right, not in the neighbor's yard and stuff. I came back, was talking to my fiance at the time. She was on the front step, and I was facing her. Some guy come out the car, come around the van, start shooting. I got hit instantly. Once in the neck, it spun me. The other one supposedly, what we think, struck me in the back of the head by a graze, because I do have lifted skin on my skull and I got a bullet still stuck inside of my throat right in the C3 vertebrae and basically dropped people were screaming stop breathing it was uh, foaming foaming out the mouth blood was gushing out of my mouth because I couldn't breathe but somebody at the house that I invited happened to um, just finish their their ambulance class with him. I think it's like emergency class or something. So he detained me and knew what to do, elevated my feet, and calmed the situation down until the police got there. Uh, they put me in a hospital. They put me in an ambulance. I think it was a fire ambulance. So took me to the hospital. They drove four screws into my skull, two on the forehead, two on the side, one on one side, one on the other side put a halo on me while I was awake. But I was like in and out of consciousness really. About five o'clock in the morning, I saw my mom, I saw my stepdad, I think my stepbrothers, people that were there but didn't really know what was going on. Uh, I couldn't breathe out tubes in my throat, my neck, my nose, I was chomping on them, trying to figure out the situation. Plus I couldn't move either. Start singing. Birthday to
Chris Greer is an AAU coach from Michigan whose teams have reached the Elite Eight six of the last seven years. Yes. Good. Come on, Lane. We're talking about top to bottom yes. accomplishments. Um, I think consistently, nationally, our program has, you know, been at the highest level. Now, there's a lot of, and, and you know, you can't go by rankings, but there's a lot of different outlets that come up with these rankings every year of national programs. There hasn't been a year that we haven't been in the top five, and that's dating back to 1997. So when I say number one in the country, I, I, you know, I say that based on our legacy. <clears throat> now, every year we might not be considered the, one, the, the best team in the country, or we might not win absolutely the most tournaments, but consistently, we're always among that top five. So if we went out 98, we won Vegas. Well, some years I've played the championship or, and lost. Sometimes I've lost in the final four. But no team consistently has been at the highest level like the Michigan Hurricane. That's what I would say. That. And then just every year we have you know, an All-American player. We have you know, one or two guys that that get an opportunity to participate in the round ball classic, which is the original high school All-American game. It used to be called the Dapper Dan by Sonny Vaccaro. So um, we've had a guy playing that game consistently every year. And um, I don't think there's many programs that can, that can say that they've done all the things that we've done. Ladies and gentlemen, game number two today, on court number two, we have the North San Diego Wildcats playing and one ARC South. Uh, well, that's basically how I got to um, where I'm at right now. I mean, they got me to be a top 15 player, top 10 player in the country, and um, they got me to um, go all these scholarship offers, Michigan State, Syracuse, um, etc., all these others. and. Um, the exposure is, I mean, it's the best exposure you can get in the country. The opportunity to play with the Michigan Hurricanes is just, um, it's incredible. So. Oh, four, Olu, six, six, two, God, Brown, Blunt, Michigan, Flint, Northwestern High School. Going up. It helped me a lot because, uh, you know, playing with the Hurricanes, you know, working with Fifth Grid, I was able to, you know, I was able to explore a lot of the uh, options, you know, towards my career in basketball. Chris has brought us nothing but great talent, great kids. Uh, we translated that through the years where these kids have grown up and you know, I watched Jason Richardson, you know, Charlie Bell, all the great kids. Most of the kids that played in a, uh, the NCAA champions at Michigan State were kids that came through the programs. You know, the Flint connection. Our best years have been because of the guys in Flint. LeBron James. LeBron James. King James. LeBron James. LeBron James. LeBron James. LeBron James is the shit. I ain't never been matched on the microphone. Pitch it at. Let a nigga press. Yes, it's on. Yes, it's on. Like a game of Donkey Kong. I know I'm wrong, but I don't know right from wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. Arrogant like Allen I. Throw my hands in the sky, repping F.O.I. Come on. Pack game like Jordan. Come overseas touring. Halizzi and Don P. The nigga keep pouring. Serving all y'all cats up. Players better back up. That's the only way you put the mat up, yeah. smack it. Every hold is up in my facility. Y'all yeah. niggas know you came my fault. My ability is definitely in the category. Oh, All by yourself, it's the power of the king story. I catch a moments like a Polaroid picture. <laughs> Vividly, lyrically, it ain't no mystery. I'm Brian James of the whole game. Blow like propane. Y'all already know my name. Young AJ Gray is clay in his hands. You know? The rap pay lay his back for his pay. Main attraction, action, and close caption. The Bo Jackson are rapping with no practicing Networks wanna know my network uh, You want the expert, send me my check first it. Dollar for dollar, what? young and popular Popping my collar, holla money in the That experience, for me, was like, you know, a pat on my back You know, like, wow, okay, now this is coaching You know, to be able to sit back and have a kid play We talking about a kid that might become the greatest ever and I had an opportunity coaching. Um, that experience was, put it to you like this, the experience was so exciting that Olu looked like he was going to be a lottery pick that weekend. And Olu's a good player and might make it to the NBA one day. 
LeBron James, you know, he got the all-around game, can pass, shoot, you know, just, you know, like the team plays again, you know, he's a great leader. But LeBron, the thing that's so special about LeBron is he elevates everyone's play. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> Chris Ben asked me when I was going to make an appearance on the Hurricanes team. My last year AU basketball, I was really undecided about what team Woo! I was going for and stuff. Please work out, please work out, please work out. Yeah, I wanted to play for them a lot, but I had my team back home. And I had to stick with them for a little bit, but when I found out they came in Cleveland, I had to put on that pot of blue and white. I never thought I would see the day where every poor person, every thug, every citizen will unite and cheer on the kids from Flint. It was a day where you were proud to be from Flint. I knew deep down in my heart that Mo Cleves, Mo Pete, Charlie Bell, Jason Richardson will represent the heart and soul of the city of Flint. To be from Flint is an honor. They gave every street ball player, every drug dealer, and most important, every kid hope again. Winning that championship at Michigan State let America know we are here. They chose to go to school and play together with a goal and a vision in mind, and they succeeded in that vision, and they accomplished their goals. So you can't do nothing but uh, appreciate what they did for Flint and getting Flint name out there as far as the Flintstones is concerned. And uh, I applaud their performance. I was there watching every step of the way, and I was with them, and they were in my prayers. Lil' Brad was busted with eight pounds of weed, six illegal guns, and other minor charges. He is facing 15 years in prison. Even though drugs was a major part of his life, he would never get the credit he deserved for causing all the good in other lives. It was sad to see his father watch his oldest boy taken to prison, but his father know the consequences of those acts. Going to prison is just part of the game. And only the strong survive. And Little Broad is strong. And after all, he is a Flint Town kid. Even in high school, me and my boys ambitious class. Cause they wanted to skip first class and and live first class <laughs> and try to drive first class. I mean they would do anything to get the fast cash and then think about the day when the last shall be first and the first shall be last and you'll finally see your boy for whom you used to pour out a little Miller genuine draft and before you can even ask laugh or give him dab he gonna say it was all a dream dog the money the cars and the clothes it was all a dream the drugs the clubs and the women it was all a dream God, God was the only reality. Talk to him right quick then. Yeah. It's a hit and I know you heard it. Scooter step on this track with so much spurring. You can feel a beat, but listen to lyrics. I don't pull no sugar if it ain't got, I don't hurry. Jumped off the pole.
coach as a youth To my east coast niggas not the post but the stoop You see my life is a tree and these lyrics is the fruit So when you take a bite be prepared for the truth Bad boys moving silence and I sleep when I'm dead Shorty I'm out here hungry nigga trying to get fed Don't even close my eyes when I lay in the bed Good guys been this last I guess I'm back cause I'm ahead And don't play with me when I'm praying to my tempo You keep talking shit I put that thing to your tempo We still ride with these we a push up for a tempo Man I'm out here grinding cause me and my nigga tempo Flint town kids yeah. bad to the bone to Hat the to bone. the right yeah. pack in the chrome uh-huh. Flint town kids uh-huh. bout making stacks yeah. Nigga ride yeah. finger waves yeah. and a Cadillac yeah. Flint town kids yeah. boy it's too cold Shorty get it crawled from here to Clay a Road Flint town kids uh-huh. won't not change dangling We bout our money man no yeah, I think it's your boy Dan Rock in the place to be From South Memphis to the FLINT I keep it tough, stupid parts don't fuss with me Cause you'll get bust in your nut trying to fuck with D Now I got niggas up in Flint quick to crack your jaw And leave your body in the ditch up in Saginaw They change your life with a stick, black tech assault And drink a cardi with your bitch getting neck and drawers They pop-